Hi, my name is Donna Hicks, and for the past 25 years, I've been uh, working as an international conflict resolution specialist, uh, mostly facilitating dialogues for parties in conflict. I've worked extensively in the Middle East on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, in Sri Lanka, in Colombia, uh, did some U.S.-Cuba dialogues, um, Northern Ireland, I mean, wherever there was a, a hot conflict, mostly my organization here at Harvard was involved in some way. And recently I've been working in, on the conflicts of Libya, in Libya and Syria, but one of the goals of bringing parties together in these dialogues was to uh, see if we couldn't get the, the, the parties to actually come up with a jointly uh, thought through uh, answers to the issues that, that divided them. So typically what happens is when you have dialogues with, in negotiations, the two parties bring their, um, they bring their proposals together and then they wrangle over how they're going to fit them. But this was a u really unique uh, way of approaching dialogue in that we were having them work jointly on the issues that divided them. Now, that's all very fine. The problem was I was often uh, just really surprised by what I call another conversation that was taking place in the room. And that conversation, if I were to characterize it, was, was they were highly emotional reactions to what was taking place in the, uh, in the discussions. And I would watch these reactions and the parties would be, get so upset. And finally I, I said to myself, wait a minute, I think we're having the wrong conversation here. I think we need to be talking about these emotional issues that are you know, derailing our attempts at trying to resolve these conflicts. And, but you know, if I were to say to the high power negotiators with whom we were working, if I were to say to them, okay, let's talk about the time when you felt emotionally upset by the other side. Well, I promise you, nobody would want to talk about that. They would say, these issues are political. These, the issues that were dividing us are political. Once we get them worked out, everything's going to be fine. Well, I'm, I wasn't convinced of that. And so forget about asking them to talk about an emotional experience that upset them. What I was interested in um, was trying to figure out how could we bring this conversation to the table instead of these political issues. And so one day I had this, I had this what I call an epiphany, and I was thinking, I know what this is about. What they really want to be saying to each other is, how dare you treat us this way? Or can't you see we're suffering? Can't you see my community is hurting? And don't you think we're human beings? So then I realized these, these issues were all about dignity. And I thought, maybe if I frame these, these issues about, around dignity, that we can have this discussion. All right. So I tried it. I, I actually tried this out uh, on a con in a dialogue I was doing. And lo and behold, not only was everyone willing to have a conversation about these dignity issues, everybody ha wanted to tell a story, but they also wanted to tell a story about their ancestors' dignity violations and the tremendous burden that they felt bringing these, um, b bringing these, these stories and these narratives to, into, the, um, you know, into the conversation. So, all right, fast forward again. I realized that we were having the wrong conversation. We need to figure out how to talk about dignity. And I started doing research. I researched this topic for several years, and I came to a couple of conclusions. Number one, um, the philosophers were having, did a wonderful job bringing this conversation, uh, talking about what dignity is, but they didn't have practical answers to the questions that I was concerned with. How do we know what it's like when someone honors our dignity? What does it feel like to have our di dignity dishonored? Well, how do we know if we're actually treating someone with dignity? But I could not find any answers to those practical questions. So I ended up writing my own book. Um, and I came up with a very simple definition, which was that dignity is about our inherent value and worth. And I think we were, it would be easy to see that. The other part of it, of the definition, is about our inherent vulnerability. Because just as we are vulnerable, uh, human beings are vulnerable to physical injuries, where our dignity is also vulnerable uh, to attack. So this, is, this value and vulnerability is a very simple way of thinking about inherent value, by the way. We're all born with it. Now here's the thing. We're all born with value, but we're not necessarily born knowing how to act like it. So this is part of dignity education. 
So um, when, I, when I finished the book and it got published, I was really expecting it would make a contribution to my field of international conflict. But what I didn't expect was that it was going to touch a nerve in the corporate world, in healthcare, in education, faith communities, and so on. And what it made me realize was that dignity wasn't just applicable to international conflicts and politics. It's about being a human being and that each and every one of us wants to be treated with dignity. And once I realized that, um, this became a, a much broader issue for me, a much broader agenda, uh, and I've been working in all of these different areas. And the conclusion that I come to, well, I've, I've, I've come up with what I call the 10 elements of dignity, which were really helpful to people in understanding what dignity is and making it operational. So for example, the 10 elements very quickly are that everybody wants their identity accepted. People want recognition for their unique qualities and way of life. They want to be acknowledged when something bad happens to them. They want safety, and I'm not just talking about physical safety, I'm talking about psychological safety too, being free from humiliation. Uh, but inclusion, uh, people want to be understood, people want to be treated fairly, people want to be given the benefit of the doubt, and finally people want an apology when someone does them wrong. So armed with all th this, these, these tools, these dignity tools, it helped people understand why they were feeling so bad, and it put a name to it. So that was, a, that was a big contribution, I think, just naming what dignity is and what it looks like. But also, I want to say that typically people always say, well, what we have to do to resolve our conflicts is find common ground. Well, I don't think it's common ground that we need. I think it's higher ground. Because dignity, I think, this yearning for dignity that all of us want is our highest common denominator. Everybody but wants to be treated as if we mattered. And if we could find ways to resolve our conflicts by treating each other with dignity, um, because that is our highest common denominator, we all, we all want it, I honestly think the world would be a very different place.